I would like to introduce our guests of whom I am, I am so honored to have them here today. They are such community leaders in Chinatown and we are just so, so lucky to have them here. Um, Professor Andrew Liang, Associate Professor in the Philosophy Department in the College of Liberal Arts at UMass Boston, where he teaches legal studies, Latino and Asian American studies. Uh, we've also got Angie Liu, the Executive Director of the Asian Community Development Corporation, the ACDC. She also serves on HUD's Housing uh, Counseling Federal Advisory Committee representing the real estate industry. Uh, we have got Ling Mei Wong, a journalist who has led the community newspaper, The Sampan, as editor of the bilingual Chinese, Chinese English community newspaper based in Boston's Chinatown from 2012 to 2020. And then we have Cynthia Yi. Cynthia is an educator. She is a writer. She is an artist. She is a collaborator. And through her work, she explores the themes of what makes for thriving community life and child development, how structural racism oppresses, how feminism can be nurtured, and how social justice can look in America. Um, Thank you guys so much for joining us. I am both humbled and so delighted you are all here with me. And for our esteemed audience members, if you have questions for our panelists, please put them in the Zoom chat. Um, I wanna get started with defining what, what does gentrification mean? So Investopedia defines gentrification as quote, a process of urban development in which a city neighborhood develops rapidly over a short time changing from low to high value. But through whose lens do we define what is high value and low value? Andrew, do you want to start us off on this one? Yeah, sure. When, when we say value, you know, look, let's be serious. You know, we're talking about in monetary terms, right? So it's really, you know, displacing the lower income with a higher income group of people coming in, uh, in that particular geographical area. So, so for instance, with, with us, you know, when we say classically gentrification, you know, we are usually talking about a uh, uh, housing structure by housing structure, block by block kind of slower gentrification, uh, kind of similar to what we see in, in the South End happening throughout the 80s. But in Chinatown, what we see is just mega gentrification where a whole parcel of land all of a sudden is, is uh, demolished, all the buildings, and then a skyscraper goes in. Ling Mei, do you wanna to add to that at all? Um, I mean, I think Chinatown has just changed so rapidly. So I'm a Boston transplant. I moved here 10 years ago to marry my college boyfriend. He went to BC for undergrad and grad and we were long distance. And I was just like, nope, this isn't working. So I moved myself from Taipei, Taiwan to here and, um, 10 years ago, um, I used to have to like, you know, pay cash at a toll booth on the Mass Pike. And now it's, you know, digital tolling. Um, there were maybe two bubble tea places in Chinatown. Um, I've lost count of how many bubble tea places there are now. Uh, it used to be you could get a bubble tea for $3. Now it's $7 plus tax. And so um, I think um, what Andrew said about value being monetary is, is really, really true. But um, I, again, I spent seven years. I'm the editor of Sampan. Uh, Sampan is a small river boat that unloads cargo boats. And that's sort of what we want to do. Like we broke down like sort of like national things, state things and city things and sort of just like, okay, what does it mean for Chinatown? The mayor is doing this. What? That means they're like ripping up our roads and they're not filling in our potholes. Like, no, this is not okay for Chinatown. And so value is um, sort of just having a community, having sources. Um, we're going to talk about language access. My former newspaper that I edited for seven years was bilingual in English and Chinese because it's like um, I came from, I was born in Taiwan, but um, I speak perfect English because my parents were just like, you're going to college in the States. So I went to English school or I went to international school in, in Taiwan. Um, but for, say, Cynthia, like she was born in the States. She can she has really good toy sunnies, but for her to read a Chinese newspaper is going to be really hard. And so uh, Sam Pan was bilingual language of Chinese. It's a free newspaper, but it had a lot of value. And so there's sort of also like that high-low lens, but like there's also that cultural value, like what value do you put at language access? Um, I had 
state representatives and like their interns or their media liaisons would just be like, I really like Sampian. I don't have to put in Google Translate what you wrote in Chinese. I can read it in English. And it's just like, oh, oh, okay. You didn't really mention this thing that the governor's doing, but you really picked up on like driver's licenses for undocumented people. Like that would be a concern. So, um, and um, because I worked in the community for seven years, um, it's long hours. I'm a hungry girl. Um, I would go to businesses and I'd get my meals comped. And it's like, hey, I'm in your business. I want to spend money and I want to support your business. And like owners would just be like, hey, you're doing community work. You're writing about like my neighbors, the local businesses. Angie and I have been interviewed for like so many projects or different magazines and features and stuff. And um, if they knew I was eating, I would get my meal comped. And it's just like, I don't know how you can put a value at that. Like, yes, it's a meal, but it's also very meaningful. It's a token of appreciation. Um, my last name is Wong. My father was a Wong. And if I step into Wong Family Association, the first thing the elders ask me is, what village did you come from? And I'm like, my dad's village? Like, from that many, many years ago before he moved to Hong Kong. And they were just saying like, yeah, we want to know if you're this family of Wongs or the other village of Wongs. Like, it's very much about roots and knowing where you're based. And like that value is maybe not monetary, but like, it's definitely like valuable. Well, Chinatown is based on a village model. My, I grew up in Chinatown. So you grew up like in a village. <laughs> As you get a real a real sense when you're walking through there of, of community as a whole. Thank you guys for really defining that for us. I, I want to talk now a little bit about um, you know, kind of that that village model, right? That that Cynthia just mentioned and and pass this to Angie to start when we talk about developing development in a community, what does development entail? And who is ultimately intended to benefit from it? Is it the actors causing the development change or is it the community itself? Sure. Um, and I think because of the context and the theme of this panel, you're really referring to real estate development. And so, you know, I want to follow up with, you know, what Andrew had said earlier, which is it's really about monetary value. Real estate development in the capitalist system we have has never been intended to be equitable. Let's keep that in mind, right? So all this development, um, shiny new buildings, um, the value going up in a particular neighborhood getting more and more expensive um, has never uh, been intended to be equitable or um, you know, um, beneficial to the community to which it's happening to. Um, however, my organization, which is a nonprofit, um, and we are a community development corporation. So we take the community development part um, seriously because we stretch the definition of uh, development. It is not solely about real estate development, which is really about, um, maximizing profits for the investors and its funders, right? Um, that's what happens in these um, luxury buildings. Um, because community development, the value is not so much about how much monetary profit it can generate, but it's really about um, going back to what the other said, it's creating the, the values. What, what are important to this community? So it could be um, community cohesion, a sense of belonging, the ability to stay in the neighborhood of your own choosing without fear of being evicted or displaced. Um, those are the values that the residents of Chinatown um, value. Um, so, you know, when we approach development, it's more along the lines of developing and preserving affordable housing. Um, which in itself, if you try to do it on your own, it's a money losing proposition, um, which is why no sane developer would do that on their own, um, but we are mission driven. Um, it's about um, creating um, a welcoming public spaces, um, 
that um, families um, feel like they belong and children can play alongside with their grandparents. Um, it's about making sure that small businesses can survive um, while um, rents are going up um, without the fear of having um, large chain businesses or businesses that are going to cater um, to a different population. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, Andrew, do you have anything to, to add on to, to Angie's? I, I, I actually do. Um, you know, I mean, Angie's talking about, you know, CDC within a particular, you know, more of a contemporaneous you know, confine. Whereas, and, and so what happens in Chinatown really is illustrative and it informs us on a national debate of what the values are of us Americans, right? Because, you know, back in the day, uh, you know, when, when I was involved in various different development from a, from a nonprofit perspective, uh, for instance, you know, the, the infamous Oak Street building before it became metropolitan, um, back in the 80s, I re recall taking my wallet out taking one dollar out and giving it to the director of the BRA at that point in time as consideration so that we now, the community, own the building, own the land, okay? But that, why, why was that you know, available for us you know, to, to have a transaction based on one dollar, right? Because we had a higher sense of, of value as Americans, as public policy that we should have and we should promote affordable housing and better our communities. Whereas, you know, after the 80s, everything is gone. Public, public money for, for public housing, okay? So now we have to count on private developers. And, and their goal is not to do better for our community. Their goal is to maximize the profits. And in order to maximize the profits, they're going to build as big, as high as possible in order to reap as much profits as possible. So th those values are contradictory, right, to us having a real viable community. And going back to your earlier question about, you know, whose values, uh, the, I mean, yes, it's monetary value, but the kind of value that we are losing is the sensibility of what was a community. So all the infamous cases and studies that was done about the destruction of the West End in Boston, you know, they all very much resonate to what's going on in Chinatown as well. Um, kind of jumping off that, that there's, you know, the, the, the tension that we see mic micro cost cosmically, I'm losing my words because I, I need a coffee at 721 at night, um, on a microcaustic level, um, looking at that tension. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the tension of popularity and desire and, and investing in a community. So I recently moved to Boston, I was telling everybody, and when you look up, best restaurant in Boston, a huge percentage of the hotspots listed are, are in Chinatown, ranging from neighborhood institutions that have been there for generations to new venues. So how, how does a community balance being the social destination of a sitting, city with preserving the affordable housing and rents to support the aforementioned institutions and small businesses? Um, Angie, do you want to start us on that? And then Andrew's nodding, so we'll, we'll head over there next. Sure. Um, Boston's Chinatown, like many other Chinatowns across the country, um, generates a lot of its economic activity through tourism um, and through visits by outsiders, right? Um, at least pre-pandemic times, we saw, you know, on the weekends, um, you really had to wait for hours to get any dinner. Um, and we have seen that um, during the last two years, the small businesses in Chinatown have been hit especially hard because of that reliance on tourism and outside visitors for that economic activity. Um, you know, many people might not realize if you're just visiting Chinatown from time to time to um, visit one of the one of the top restaurants, um, you might not realize that it is actually also a residential neighborhood. Now, the residential parts um, by and large are uh, south of Neyland Street, but even north of Neyland Street in the 
part of um, the restaurant district upstairs, there are actually a lot of people living there too. And I think that's something that's um, kind of skewered. It's very much um, both a commercial and a residential neighborhood. Um, and the challenge is how do we make sure that the people who work and service um, in, in these establishments can continue to stay in Chinatown? Um, think about um, the dishwashers, the people who serve your meals, the people who um, cook the dishes. They have to live somewhere. Many of them actually live um, in Chinatown. Our organization um, actually just um, bought a building right by the Chinatown gate. It has a restaurant on the ground floor and 14 units upstairs. Um, and they are occupied um, by and large by restaurant workers. Um, they make it work somehow. Um, sometimes I am asked why people have to live in Chinatown because if you follow strictly the um, rules of supply and demand, if rent is too expensive in the heart of downtown in Chinatown, tough luck, move somewhere else where it's cheaper, right? However, um, many of the workers, um, many of the low-income residents don't actually have that as a choice. Uh, many of them are recent immigrants who have limited English uh, capacity, um, who really rely on the numerous social service agencies in the neighborhood as well as the informal social networks to get access to jobs, to find out where to live, um, to get um, letters translated that they got from their kids' schools. Really basic things like that that I think a lot of people don't realize. Um, and that is the challenge. Um, we want to make sure that it remains a destination um, to support the economic um, vibrancy. However, we also want to make sure that the people who make all that economic activity possible, it's not just the small business owners, but it's really the workers. It's um, really on the backs of the workers and we need to make sure that they have affordable places to live. Thank yeah, you. I mean, I'm in absolute agreement with that. So that, you know, classically, when we're talking about uh, and, and analyzing Chinatowns, I always talk about it within a dual persona type of a status, right? But the problem is when we go through Chinatown, we always look only at eye level, human level. We never look at the second story, the third story and say, hey, you know, what's up there? You know, what is that thing, that family association or, you know, do people actually live here? And so that's the kind of, you know, contradiction that we have when we go in, we don't know this, this is actually a community uh, with mixed zoning of both, both businesses as well as residential. And so we have the mindset as we go in and public policy politicians as well, that it's only a business district, right? And which means that the quality of life, if it, if it you know, uh, is, is much more towards a residential base, needs to be improved. Garbage pickup you know, needs to be improved, you know, traffic flow, whatever it is, right? And so that is traditionally the main issue of, of concern that we have in Chinatown, people's inability, public policy's inability to see that it is actually both a residential as well as a small business district. Wing Mei, do you have anything to add to that one? Man, it's hard to follow up Angie and Andrew, but... Um, I think, um, yeah, it's like, right, if you look up Chinatown, or when the Globe and like the Herald mentioned Chinatown, it's like, there's a hot new restaurant, go try bubble tea. And it's like, did you know that there's a swing set in Chinatown? And it has like Cynthia's like poems and stories on it. Like you can, there's parks, like there's the Chinatown gate that everyone takes pictures of, but like, there's so much more like go south of Neeland cross the crazy cars that try to run the red lights to get to the Mass Pike. And I don't want to talk about the car crashes that happen because I, again, seven years in Chinatown, um, yeah, the traffic, those drivers do not want to stop for pedestrians, but um, it's very much where people live. I worked at a nonprofit. Um, uh, so the Sampan is published by the Asian American Civic Association, which is a social service agency that was founded by a social worker named Amy Goon. And um, next door to my nonprofit was um, a family of five. Uh, um, so like four adults, one child, 
their roof was leaking, their windows had total draft, there was like toxic mold around the windows because it was wet and drafty. And they were determined to stay in Chinatown and they would pay exorbitant rents and they would go with whatever the landlord decided to like jack up their rent with every year because they wanted their son to go to the best elementary school in Boston. And that's the Josiah Quincy Elementary School that's in Chinatown. And that's a school that has um, a Chinese American principal. She was born and raised in Boston, Chinatown. Her name is Cynthia Suhu. Um, not Cynthia Yi. Cynthia Yi is also a teacher, but Miss Suhu literally lived across the road from the school. And so um, there's a school in Chinatown. Like there's like, Chinatown Village has like 200 some affordable units and like 500 like people. Like those are families, those are elders, those are children. Taitung Village right before, right during Lunar New Year had a water pipe break because someone decided to smoke and set off a sprinkler and it flooded a nonprofit that does like after school services for children and does like adult ESL and does a lot of like family outreach. But it's sort of just like, where was the globe on that? Where was that story? And I was just like, how are the Taitung village residents not just like screaming and like going to the press and like they should be on front page TV. It's like, okay, let's see the evening news. What a squirrel, like, I mean, are the squirrels paying for like TV media access? Like, it's just sort of just like, again, I'm, I was, a, like, I did run a community newspaper as an editor. And so I will always want to bring the voices of immigrants. I want to bring the voices of the underserved community. Um, but it's very much like there's housing. Um, I was, and I played a game with my mom this morning, which was, um, Angie helped develop a lot of affordable housing and it requires building a market rate houses that can pay for these affordable units because these units don't build themselves. You need cash to build these affordable houses. And so in 2018, there was a housing lottery. There were 95 units built. I told my mom to guess how many housing applications came in and she was like, oh, 200. I'm like, try 4,500 applications for only 95 units like that is how much people want to be in Chinatown yes it's crowded yes it's dense sometimes on trash day it gets a little smelly but it's where you can have social services it's where you can have like Angie said like you get this English letter from your kid's teacher like what does it mean is my kid in trouble like oh actually it's a it's a it means my kid is doing a good job or like they need to be promoted to like, you know, the gifted class, like, oh, that's, what is this gifted class? Like there are so many things that get lost in translation and that you really need culturally competent people and people who are sensitive and know language. And Chinese people are not monolithic. Um, Angie and I speak Mandarin. Cynthia speaks Toisan. I don't speak Toisan. I speak Cantonese. I speak Mandarin. I speak English but um, I don't speak Taiwanese, I don't speak Hokkien. Like there's so many different languages. Shanghai and Beijing have their own, like Beijing has its own form of Chinese too. And um, not- They created a national language for China because of that, called Mandarin. <laughs> it's Pohua, which is the general language, but it's not spoken or like in the countryside, in the rural areas, in, the really? in Cynthia's father's hometown, they speak Toysanese. So um, it's like, yes, no, Boston, no, 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 social no. happening spot. But Chinatown is so much more than just a place to get like drunk after like a comedy show. Well, no, Toysan, Toysan children speak Mandarin uh, because it is the national language. So it's enforced in the schools. And it used to be that there were no, you would never hear children. You at, there's a certain time period nobody spoke Tyson, no no immigrants spoke Tysonese, no children spoke Tysonese. And about 10 years ago, I heard a group of children speaking Tysonese. I was very surprised. And I said, wow, that's my parents' immigration. That was, you know, post-World War II. I said, you came from Tyson. I said to the mother, I said, why did you come to America? She said, because we could not trust the food supply. And they only have one child. It was a girl, okay? She said, we have to wash everything, make sure everything is clean. And that's why we came to America. 
so our daughter will not get poisoned uh, from the food supply. And at that, how interesting, you know, and they're from Tyson and they know, they know Mandarin because my Tysonese relatives all know Mandarin. It's like we all have to go to school for English. You go through so, Mandarin. I, I, uh, housing, I want to say two things that's sort of historical about housing. Uh, Chinese people like to live together many times because it's cheaper. And when, when I was growing up, one of the reasons uh, uh, people were, uh, they had to ride a van to work in suburban restaurants. Suburban restaurants came in. And so they left their wife and children in Chinatown and they would uh, be van to housing in Maine or wherever. And they would live in these dormitories, okay? Cause you had to go live where your restaurant was. And that's one thing. And uh, when I was a child, also all the commercial areas were across Newland Street, the north side, I think, right, Angie? And all the residential area was on the south side. So it was very clear when the fathers all lined up like a parade to go to work, uh, they crossed Newland. So Newland was the big divide between commercial and residential life. And no more. I, I actually predate Taitang Village. I remember when it was being built. And I always say high rises do not replace row houses. I think everybody just set us up really, really perfectly for what my next question was going to be. So I think we're ready to just dive into it, which is, uh, can, can you speak to the current housing crisis uh, rapid development has caused in Boston's Chinatown? And what are the ancillary human rights disasters uh, ignited by housing insecurity? Um, Andrew, do you want to start us off for that one? Well, um, yeah, so back in, well, geez, almost 10 years ago, 2013, at the end of 2013, we issued a three Chinatown gentrification report coming out of uh, New York City, uh, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, ALDEF, where we studied Boston, uh, New York and Philadelphia. And what we noticed, you know, through the various different an analysis of demographics and the census data was that, you know, each Chinatown was shrinking in so far as, you know, Asian API population. And in particular with, with Boston, uh, we, we, at one point in time, you know, we were talking about, you know, 80%, you know, within Chinatown being Asian. Uh, and by, by about 2000 and into 2010, you know, we were looking at numbers in the 50s, and by by you know by the time that we issued the report, you know, we were looking at the HPI population being 46 percent and the white population being 41 percent, which means by this point in time, most likely they have overtaken uh, um, the Asian population uh, because of the rapid amount of units that's being developed. Right, and the kind of different classes of people coming in, and so that that's the you know kind of problem that that we're having, um, you know, in so far as not being able to catch up to having low income affordable housing units being available, uh, in contrast with the kind of developments that city hall uh, have have encouraged in the past, which is luxury high rise developments. Because if you, if you, you know, stand in Chinatown and you look all around, all you see are luxury high rises, right? And you'd be able to ask, you know, who, who can actually afford to live in those particular units? And we know who, you know, the, when we, we've seen articles, we look, you know, read uh, um, and talk to real estate brokers and we know that, you know, people buy cash down in some of these particular units. Right, but for some of the various different, you know, very very low percentages of affordable housing that you know we're able to do, whether it's for CDC or you know other type of vehicles, you know, so those are the kind of you know real challenges you know ahead of us, where City Hall no longer is into developing as much public housing, affordable housing as possible. That's almost like ancillary. You know, the the the, the rigor is to do luxury high rises and maybe as a community benefit we'll give you you know whether there's 10 percent set aside or whatever it is right and so that's the kind of problem that we're never going to be able to 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 chase after you know corporate uh, welfare type development so anyone want to add to uh to andrew's brilliant statement i mean it's it's everything you guys are saying i, I can answer <laughs> Angie can answer this. 
Yeah, I think uh, I just want to add that, um, I mean, the housing crisis, you know, it's been long brewing years in the making, even before the pandemic, but the pandemic has certainly exacerbated um, the housing pressures. Um, certainly, we we see um, and, and hear about evictions, and um, we know that um, the actual rate of displacement is likely higher than the reported um, evictions because many people, when they get um, notices or even when their landlord says, I'm going to raise the rent next month by a few hundred dollars, people don't even wait for the formal notices or and don't um, never make it to the housing court proceedings um, and they voluntarily move. But that is still a form of displacement. Um, we know um, that many other people, um, like Ling Nei alluded to earlier, um, are willing um, to put up with just um, substandard housing conditions, living in very overcrowded conditions um, to be able to stay in Chinatown. And when something breaks um, or when their roof leaks, when there's mold, they might be afraid to raise it with their landlord because they know that the landlord could say, I'm going to turn you out because I could rent it to a tough student for a lot more money. Um, and, and that's what happens. Um, now, you know, with this new mayor, um, one of the most interesting things that she's proposing, um, although I guess controversial to some people, is the idea of rent stabilization slash rent control. Because as Andrew said, we can never ever build enough affordable housing to catch up with the rate and pace of um, displacement. Um, you know, when we build affordable housing because of the complexities of permitting and financing, it can take years. A quick project for, for my organization is something that um, from conception to finish, um, a, a three to four year project is considered fast. And we've had other projects that have dragged on for you know more than five years. The one Greenway project that Ling Nei alluded to earlier with the 95 affordable housing projects, um, that took probably a decade. So we can, and there's also not enough public subsidies available to be able to build and create enough affordable housing for everybody that needs it. And therefore something like um, you know, approaching from the other end, um, something to stabilize rent, um, that is something that we desperately need. Yeah, no, so actually, you know, I, I, I slipped in a term back then when I said corporate welfare development, and I really didn't tease out what I meant by that, okay? You know, so at the same time that we understand just from Andrew's explanation about how difficult it is, how you know, long time it takes to do, you know, affordable housing, um, corporate welfare housing means uh, development means that you know with all these you know millionaire billionaire developers they get all the assistance from city hall right so if you take a look at any of the various different variances the exceptions you know with zoning you know most of the various different uh, neighborhoods within Chinatown area they are zoned maybe eight stories ten stories so why in the world do these, you know, private developers come in with initial plans about 30 stories, right? Or even 40 stories. They plan it at 40 stories so that, you know, once the, the community knows about it and raise a ruckus about it and protest about it, they're going to negotiate down to 30 when it's zoned for 20, okay? So, but it's city hall that should be flexing its muscles to say, it's zoned for 10 stories, it's zoned for 15. Your plan needs to be at that height and no more, right? So when, when City Hall reneges on that particular you know, uh, muscle, they allow corporate welfare to take place, okay? And all the various different benefits packages that's supposed to be going back into communities for affordable housing, they never pay into it. You know, we've seen, I don't know how many Boston Globe studies done, done about this. So is there any legal recourse that the community has to, to answer to that, to, to fight off that, to fight off that sort of gentrification? 
jump in real quick or I get a lot of angry beater letters and it's sort of just like, I applied for the 95 units and why didn't I get in? And it's just like you and 4,000 other people, you know, <laughs> those 95 units had like 45 times that amount of interest. And then um, I'm sure Angie would love to magically build 4,000 units of housing, but it's, you need money. It's, you need labor, you need lumber, you need like <laughs> really high skyscraper buildings. Um, you need density. Uh, Boston Chinatown is already the densest neighborhood in Chinatown. We are like up close and with our neighbors and like above that bubble tea shop might be a family of five, you know. Um, the Metropolitan's a high rise. I, as I mentioned, Taichung Village is like about 200 units of like 500 people in one housing project. Castle Square is I think also about like 500 people and a couple hundred units and like they have a community center and they have like a, a really nice green space in Castle Square but that was all built before I was born <laughs> like in the 50s 60s Cynthia you can correct me if I'm wrong so I but... was born <laughs> I'll tell you all about it if I have a chance to talk you only have 15 minutes and they're just like, yeah, like legal recourse is just literally like you write angry letters, you hope the media shames your like shady landlord to sh shape up their act. And literally like that family that lived next door to my office, the four adults and the one kid that were stuck in like two bedrooms and like the tiniest kitchen ever, like we would go have tea and they would always offer us fruit. And it's like, they were willing to be hospitable, even though they were like, crammed in like sardines and um we reported their landlord we called up city hall we filed a, a report on 311 this like there's a very angie is more familiar with with than with me than i will be on, on like the legal sorts of things to like report the shady landlord submit a report um the city hall will file a report and then an inspector will come out and we did it and the landlord retaliated and it was just like why like I'm a Chinese landlord. I speak your language. Like, why are you calling city hall? Huh? I'm going to raise your rent. Like I'm going to kick you guys out. And they were just like, well, we don't have a contract. We never signed a rental contract because this wasn't the landlord before the old landlord would take care of us or he'd fix stuff. Or like if there was a draft or a leaky pipe or leaking gas that they smelled gas one night and the child was the only one who had enough English to talk to the fire department. Like you, forced an elementary school kid out in the cold because of a gas leak because the new landlord is too cheap to fix stuff like so yes there are ways to do it but it's slow and it's bureaucratic and you have to file reports and it's a good thing my office was next door and, and Sampian is very odd hours because it's a community newspaper like I'd go in at noon and I'd have to be at the community meeting until 10 p.m and so it's just like well I'm off this morning because I've got a late night meeting. Um, the inspector's supposed to come from noon to 3 p.m. I'll try to be there. And literally, I would interpret because the son was at school as he should have been. But it's, yeah, there is there are legal ways to do it. You can find interpreters. The Chinese Progressive Association is leading the fight. They're um, very well connected with the Asian Outreach Unit of the Greater Boston Legal Service. Greater Boston Legal Service has written so many great um, stories for Sampan, or they submitted content on just like, here's how to get talk about how here's how to report your evil landlord. Like if they're, he's jacking up your rent or like doubling the rent in like a month and saying like, if you don't pay rent now, I'm going to kick you guys out because you don't have a rental contract in place. Like there's obviously ways to do it, but if you don't speak English, if you're not familiar with bureaucracy, if you do not know your rights as a renter, you're, 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 you can, as Angie said, you're very likely to be displaced or move yourself way out to the burbs, but you lose your community, you lose restaurants, you lose social services. Hey, Gina, can I cut in a little bit? Yeah, I was going to say, Cynthia, I wanted to ask you. Because <laughs> I, I sort of prepared some words and I don't want you to say to me, we're no time for you, Cynthia. No, 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 Cynthia. I, I, <laughs> I am the kind of person that gets like 
hyper responsible. <laughs> and I did it. I went to Tante, I sat down and I did it. And I said, I'm going to write all this and yeah. I'm not giving a speech, but I think there's some key points and maybe it is the voice of age. Okay. And I am a child who grew up in Chinatown, many of you know that. So I grew up before Taitung Village, before, before I remember the founding of Sam Han. I remember the woman that was, we were activists then. So, you know, we were the activists. I wrote about that journey in my, in my website called ARC about, you know, meeting in uh, spaces. But therefore, I, I, we we're talking about nuts and bolts, and that's very important. And I thank Andrew, I thank Angie about nuts and bolts. And I like to always think, woman and man does not live by bread alone, okay? And I think there's a spirit that Chinatown hungers for, and that is art and history. And I always say when I give tours of Chinatown for college kids, I said, you know, um, buildings are memory markers. If a grandfather can say, oh, to her son, I used to go then have coffee. That means a lot, okay, for that little boy growing up in those circumstances, okay? His grandfather had coffee there, and now he's having chocolate milk there. I think that rootedness, as we're talking about all this stuff, okay, about building. I think there's something that people need beyond building, okay? And I, I want to say there are people very familiar with my website, but I'm, I'm gonna say there are four guiding principles to why I began writing. I was a teacher for 35 years. Uh, I taught in Brookline for 24 and I taught in Chinatown for 10. We were the first Asian American teachers. So we were warriors, we became warriors. We were just gonna graduate from college and be good teachers, but we found myself at the front of war. Okay, people were very threatened by having Chinese teachers in the school, the establishment was threatened and I don't even want to, that's a whole nother speech. But anyway, uh, four guiding principles, okay? I, I honed it down and I really believe in this very much. It's a quote from a, a black writer named Tony K. Bambara. She says, the job of the writer is to make revolution irresistible. I love that quote. I will create such beauty in my stories I will create such beauty that when you read my stories, you are walking down through time and space, okay? And you are reimagining China that as it could be. A thriving community with children at play outdoors where everybody can go into each other's houses easily, okay? That can inform our vision for the future. And I, I write because um, I think the universality is in the specifics. If you're Brazilian, if you're Italian, you can sort of understand mother and daughter. You know, daughter having to translate for her mother, being so frustrated and rejecting it, okay? And I think, uh, and then we can also through art see ourselves, our role as privileged citizens that uh, in, in small or large ways, we actually benefit from the suffering and the oppression of people of color and immigrants. Okay. And that's the history of the USA. All right, so, but there's a sea change because of the pandemic. And so therefore I think there's hope because I think that uh, anti-Asian hate has bought the anti-Asian hate that's always been there to the fore. And uh, the killing of black lives has always been there, but now there's greater support. So black lives matter, or, you know, in uh, houses in uh, white suburban neighborhoods. So that's really good. Okay, so this, this history of oppression, Chinatown, I always say is not a collection of restaurants. It exists because of oppression, it exists because of the exclusion act. It was done on purpose, okay? Just like we put indigenous people in reservations and we put our black children in urban ghettos, we put our Chinese in Chinatowns, all right? It is our history, we must own it, all right? And art gives voice to that history because it's sort of like the, the thing we don't talk about, okay? But youth need to hear it. All right, they don't think they just arrived and they're so lucky to be recipients of America's largesse, you know? But an art is redemptive. And, and, and so therefore it curbs our impulses to, to, to uh, not ignore cruelty. We can easily ignore cruelty because we have self gain. And some of those are Chinese landlords, like you said, Ling Mei. Some of those people who are actually not so good to the Chinese families are Chinese landlords themselves. And they need to see their part in it. To me, equity is about space, sharing space. Do you have space for me at your kitchen table? Do you have space for me in your math class? Do you have space for me in your stories? And that's where art comes in. If you keep shunting children to low quality housing, polluted air, uh, well, they're going to get sick, right? 
Can you ram a highway? You can, you can ram, a, ram a highway right through my house. Why? So you can, all right? So you can drive your car, Chinatown people didn't have cars, to go to your house on the South Shore and to go to the, uh, your, your cottage on Cape Cod, all right? So why do we do that? We, it, it has to do with naming. We've been talking about that with Trumpsters and, and the idea, uh, this is, my, this is my, my third guiding principle. Whoever controls the narrative controls the universe. If you call my house tenement, the next word is urban renewal. The next word is I can knock it down. Same building I grew up in, 116th Street. If it's on Beacon Hill, you don't call it tenement. My house was lovely, okay? Brahmins lived in it, okay? Abolitionists lived in it before me, okay? And you call your house on Beacon Hill a row house. So when you call it a row house, it's no longer urban renewal. It is preservation. We have to preserve it. And, and gentrification, I think is a simplified word for what I call violent domination. It's violent and it's domination. It's domination of the land, which we did with the indigenous people. Okay, and the, the fourth thing principal I want to bring up is I write for the youth because I think the youth is our hope. But I don't just write for the youth of Chinatown, okay? I write for all youth. I taught children for 35 years. Children really don't divide. It's adults that divide it, okay? So our youth, and I learned this from the youth in Chinatown when I talked to them, they feel very proud when I said, we have contributed a lot to America. Our food, our labor, our brains, our culture, you know, and even stereotypically martial arts. And children of all races love those things, martial arts, lantern making, calligraphy. And so by doing, by telling the story and sharing this culture with children of all races is part of our Boston history. Chinatown is part of our Boston history, okay? And the narrative where we say, well, look, we welcome you. We gave you Asians a chance, you poor Asians, is not the way to talk, all right? And I never write stories like that, all right? And so the children in Chinatown, when I spoke to them, they felt so happy, they were smiling, and they felt so close to me when I said, we have contributed to this country and to this city, okay? So any avenue in which people can open up that, that, that uh, culture and that legacy of Boston, all right, is very important, not just for Chinese children, but for all children. And I've taught all kinds of children, uh, all, all countries, uh, especially in Brookline, okay? But, uh, it's like Asian American literature doesn't belong on the shelf of Asian American literature. It belongs on all shelves. And so I write because I want it, I want that youthful pride and that fellowship that comes from sharing, all children sharing lantern making, you know, lion dancing or whatever, uh, you know, eating a delicious food, drinking bubble tea, because it creates fellowship among children. It's not just your bubble tea, it's our bubble tea, you know? And so that is my vision for my art. And there are actually uh, four, I, I take, uh, I, they made a movie called Where We Belong at Emerson College. And I, I took them on an art tour. And I thank Angie for a lot of being the spearhead for a lot of the art. And Oxford Street has a mural called Where We Belong. And it has to do with rooting history of noodles, all right? The noodle factory, the Wong family owned, okay? It, it's noodles and it, it, it transforms into a dragon and the dragon goes towards Chinatown, not away from Chinatown. And then there's the swing set on Hudson Street that I, I worked together with Janice Stewart on that. There is on the bench, a tribute to all the old men, the forgotten, the silenced, the marginalized old men that were stuck here because of the Chinese Exclusion Act and the Communist Revolution. And I can point them out to you. And I did at the, uh, at the, uh, the event for uh, the Stoop Culture, you may imagine Stoop Culture, 17 Hudson Street. And my uncles live there. They come here, they work, they got stuck here. They can't go back because of the revolution and they die here alone. And the, the swing is so exquisitely designed because it has to do with play. They have benches, so you don't sit by yourself. It's not solo and you face each other. And if you sit on that bench, it's so clever. I had to sit there and swing. You will see how Chinatown is squeezed between the high rise in front of you, the row house to the left of you, the noise of the highway and the little girl is driving, ride her bike and she could not, it was only a very limited section. Okay, that's why I had the idea. That little girl has no place to ride that bike. And I know the story of all the row houses, all kinds of just juicy stories, really, to some of those row houses, you know, it was, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know, forbidden love. And I actually tell uh, 
I tell some of those stories to my college students. And then the fourth one is, the third one is Place of Assembly by Ang Lee, who's very interesting. She is Swedish Chinese. How interesting is that? La Eileen Gu, she's sent back to China, okay, to spend time with her grandmother. But it's stoop culture. And one of the most touching moments was Michelle, when Michelle, when the mayor came and she sat on the, on the stoop and her two sons were so agile, they were jumping back and forth at these stoops that moved. And I said, now that is every mother. To me, I almost almost in tears. It reminded me of all my aunts, all everybody, all the mothers sitting on stoops at night. And if we can sort of replicate that kind of community life, not necessarily boxes up in the air, high rises, okay? But what I'm saying is, it was so touching to me. I took a picture of her sitting there, and you know what? She doesn't have to be the mayor. She can be any of the mothers on Hudson Street that I grew up with, and she's watching her children play on the stoop. And why can't we have that in Chinatown? All the artists who did these three exhibitions, these, uh, these uh, public art, they all read my story because I'm a wit I witnessed the past, okay? I don't, I'm trying to center Hudson Street. Hudson Street is not gonna be a shortcut to the community. It had a thriving Tysonese life. And they, those people cannot write English. They cannot speak English, many of them. So I write the stories for them from my viewpoint. And it is, an integral part of the history of the people who helped build Boston. So, Cynthia, what can we do as Bostonians to amplify those stories, the stories that you've told, and the stories that all the panelists have told here? How can we further amplify those stories throughout Boston to make sure that everybody understands the vibrancy, the legacy, and like the love of Chinatown that you have so brilliantly, by the way. I love Chinatowns, period. I like to eat like Ling Mei. <laughs> My last story is Duck, and I, I did an interview for an art, independent art newspaper. She says, Cynthia, you have, you have food on every page. <laughs> she has so much food. I said, the story is called Duck. I said, every Chinatown child knows a duck on the house is never a pet. Um, so I said, every Chinese first kid knows that, okay? And I said, you mean the Twinkies? He goes, yeah, that's part of it. You ate all you went through Chinese school. And well, anyway, my website is, is there and it's used for free and accessible. And what, you, what can we do as a city? I think funding for the arts, which I think the mayor talked about as a priority. We don't live by bread alone. I, I worked with the community land trust from CPA and they did a wall projection. They were trying to approach it as real estate money because I know people who own Johnny Court, they're my friend's mothers. And, and they said, could you talk to them? I said, you're approaching it the wrong way. I said, if you approach it as money, they're gonna say, why should I give you the community land trust when I can give it to a, the developer who'll give me a lot of money? Yeah, my writing has to do with winning hearts and minds, but punching them in the gut. So, so well said, Cynthia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I just want to open it up for, for our last few moments together to Andrew, Angie, and Ling Mei uh, about what else we can do as Bostonians to amplify the voice and amplify the, the stories of Chinatown. Like Ling Mei said, you know, the globe wasn't covering things. How is, Bos how is Bostonians, can we make sure that we get that information and we can share it with our own communities? What can we do to support Chinatown? Like Yelp. Leave reviews on Yelp. Like everyone eats in Chinatown, but they don't leave a Yelp review. Give it five stars if you like that bubble tea place, but don't just tell your friends and not put it on Yelp. I would want to focus a little bit more in, in the primary issue that we're talking about, which is really you know public housing. I don't even want to use the euphemism affordable housing because you know the the way that you know folks go around calculating you know, using the area median income that includes the income of Western people <laughs> um, really skews the kind of area, pushes up the area median income towards the def a different definition of affordable housing that does not include the income of those people that work and still to, to a certain degree live in Chinatown. And I saw uh, an earlier question in the chat about, you know, we, we have an Asian American mayor you know, which, which seemed to, you know, make us think that, you know, she's going to be a little bit more sensitive towards the viability and, you know, survivability of, of a Chinatown community. I want to hope that, but yet at the same time, I'm not counting on it, nor should any other Bostonian that cares about, you know, historic communities count on that. 
we need to make sure that our voices are raised and uh, make, making sure that public housing exists, you know, not just in Chinatown, but all across Boston, right? And, and so, you know, I, I'm afraid that, for instance, you know, the, the mayor, you, you, you take a look at the donations that she got you know, for her inaugural, uh, one third of it came from developers. So that's, you know, that's for, you know, telling me who the, who's got the big bucks, right? You know, will we be back to uh, business as usual where the uh, developers are, are going to still get a leg up, you know, towards corporate welfare? I'm, I'm hoping not, right? But we can't just hope. We have to fight. We have to protest. We have to stay vigilant. And we have to make sure that, you know, public housing for low-income people exists for all folks across the city of Boston, not just in Chinatown. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. Yes, I mean, in order to raise our voices, we have to have a place to put our feet, right? So we have to make sure that those, those um, affordable housing uh, areas are accessible and people have places to live so that the story is that uh, Ling May and Cynthia so beautifully, beautifully told us uh, can can be told. Angie, did you want to add anything yeah, to that? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, when people, you know, on, for the attendants who, you know, if you're asking yourself what you can do, I think they're on two levels. One is more on a personal level, like all of us said that, you know, um, for a lot of outside visitors, when you go to Chinatown, you only visit the restaurants and the more commercial parts. Um, next time you're in Chinatown, maybe when it's warmer and not during a snowstorm, I really encourage you to explore South and Neelan Street. Um, check out um, the mural on Oxford Street that Cynthia referred to. Yes. Um, and the swing, um, which is um, the public art that we had worked together with Cynthia on, that's on Hudson Street, just South of Neelan on a warm day. Um, it's a beautiful place to sit, um, whether by yourself or with friends. Um, it's open to the public. Um, and you on must more swing. You must swing. Yes. And on a po policy side, right, um, there are policy um, decisions at both the city and the state level that could have really concrete implications on what happens to people um, living in Chinatown. So somebody in the chat had raised um, the TOPA bill, um, the tenant option to purchase. That is um, one of um, several really important um, legislative um, proposals um, in the state house right now that would um, enable, hopefully if it passes, um, more tenants and nonprofit organizations to be able to um, purchase buildings um, and to save them from being sold to speculative in investors. So policies like that are also really important. I just want to say a big thank you. Uh, you know, Angie, Angie saw my list of questions last week and he said, there's no way we're going to get through all this because there's too much to talk about because this is such a huge issue. So I hope that at Revolutionary Spaces, we can explore this more with um, hopefully our, our amazing panelists. And I just want to remind everybody about that um, showing of uh, the tale of three Chinatowns on March 3rd at, at Tufts. Uh, definitely check that out and put that on our calendar. Uh, I know we've run a few minutes over. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You are, I, I just feel like I, I have learned so much from you in, in such a short amount of time. All of you, Andrew, Andrew Angie, Ling Mei, Cynthia, thank you, thank you, truly um, my gratitude. Thank you all so much, my deepest gratitude, and I hope to see you back here soon. Thank you.